Hello and welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast, the podcast for event professionals who want to stay ahead of the game by learning from the leading innovators in the event industry. My name is Angela Tupper and I'm the Deputy Editor for Event MB. In this episode titled, How Data and Strategic Marketing Drive Better Event ROI, I had the pleasure of speaking with Katherine Frankson, Director of Event Marketing for Informa Connect. In this episode, Catherine shares her expertise on mining event data for insights and designing marketing strategies for today's hybrid world. Topics include how to build on what's working well, how to target specific audiences, and how to make your virtual and in-person experiences work together for the highest possible event ROI. I hope you enjoy this discussion, and I invite you to check out previous episodes of the Event Manager podcast with tips and insights from some of today's most influential event professionals. You can find all the episodes on our website or subscribe to your favorite podcast service. And now for a quick message from our sponsors, Canopy. I'm here today with Catherine Frankson, Director of Event Marketing for Informa Connect. Thank you for being here today, Catherine. Thanks so much for having me. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. How are you? I'm good too. I'm good too. <laughs> yeah, very excited about IMEX coming up and also relieved that a lot of the planning is, is uh, out of the way now. <laughs> yeah, I actually just did a post on LinkedIn. I have IMEX FOMO because I'm not able to be there next week. So mm-hmm. I have been seeing all the posts and all the content, but I will be following along very closely. I think it's going to be a really really interesting and great event. Yeah. Fantastic lineup for sure. Yeah. Okay. I want to launch into a general intro question to get to know you a little bit more. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you initially started working in events? Yeah. I started working events years ago. It was with a local publishing and event company here in Minneapolis where I'm based. And we did events for the wedding industry. So bridal events, uh, corporate events. We actually did a lot of awards. We did group tour events. Um, and that was my start. So I did everything from promotions to planning to sales. It was a small team. It was all hands on deck, which seems to be a common theme in the event industry, but, um, okay, then, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? we've all worn a lot of hats, but my background is heavily in sales. So selling exhibitions, selling sponsorships, a lot of custom sponsorships. But years ago, six or seven years ago, when I was planning my wedding, I had the realization that how I was selling was different than how I wanted to buy because you're always looking for so much stuff at the time. And I wanted people to set appointments with me, but how I was buying, I wanted to do all my own research. We were gating all of our pricing and content, but I wouldn't even consider a vendor if I couldn't get price transparency. So that's mm-hmm. when I made the move into marketing because in, in mm-hmm. my, my thought process was I want to be part of the new age of selling, which I think right. marketing is. So mm-hmm. of course, now we all know this, it's the customer journey, customers are in control, but since moving into marketing, I've been in demand gen brand and comms, and now I lead our event marketing for Informa. Mm-hmm. It's always good to keep the, the end client's perspective in mind for sure. And, yeah. you know, to design events with that in mind is also helpful. So having that marketing perspective is useful for marketers, but it's also useful for the event organizers themselves, right? Yeah. Um, you want to have that holistic approach from the beginning. So it's great that you have, you know, experience with that really hands-on event planning and then also the marketing side of things. Yeah. Well, it's harder to get lost just in your world or just in the lane that you're in or sort of the four walls of your organization. If you've if you've worn all those different hats, if you've, if you've planned, if you've sold with clients, you have a lot more empathy, obviously, hopefully we're all attending events, but if you even sponsored an event as a vendor, if you really are attending, when you have all of those different points of perspective, it gives you this bigger look at the ecosystem, which I think we all need now when we're considering strategy and event design and, you know, just kind of staying in your cross-functional area it's a lot harder to have the context that you need. For sure. I mean, you can't necessarily rely on old formulas now because things are changing so much. So you really have to be strategic about everything and consider all of the different angles, all your different stakeholders. Absolutely. 
So moving into that, I know that you're really an expert on data. Um, and we often talk about using data to prove event ROI. And the conversation is usually focused on engagement fig figures, like the number of views that a piece of content gets, or the number of comments in a chat session. How can event planners go beyond showing that attendees were engaged and actually use this data to improve their content? So going yeah. beyond sort of as a measurement of a success and actually as, yeah. you know, insights into what's working well and what isn't working well and refining your strategy accordingly. Yeah. Well, it is interesting. We're sitting on, I mean, I would wager to guess 10 times, 20 times the data that we had before, Absolutely. which is, which is great. And we're all at this point where we're going, there's more data, there's a ton of opportunity, but it lives in a lot of different areas and it can be hard to curate. And so there's a lot of opportunity there, but it's also, that is the million dollar question is how do we figure out where those data sources are? How do we get our arms around it? Are we sharing it with the right members of our, of our team? But the two big opportunities really are using the data so that you can develop either product design or a new product pipeline or creating, understanding the content that resonates so that you can create a much more personalized and relevant experience. And I would also argue, I have to say, I don't, I think sometimes when we talk about chat or, you know, looking at some of those engagement, it can, it can be a little bit in the, the vein of some, you know, vanity marketing metrics. They're not that right. bad. I mean, we can tell a lot by, you know, what those attendee tracking patterns are and, you know, what really are those sparks, those conversational sparks of engagement. So I would also say, if that's, you know, what we're gravitating towards, that's a really good start. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. That's not bad to look at that. But I think where it gets really interesting is when you do lean into that and you say, okay, great. This is what drove um, retention. This is what drove net new. This is where we're seeing, you know, alumni renewals. This is what, wow, it's really interesting to see that these marketing channels drove the most for this topic, especially if you're developing content for, I don't know, different personas or just different problems that you think your audiences are trying to solve. And when you find what's performing the best, then you can take that and turn that into your event content pillar. And that's where it gets really right. interesting. So instead of sort of going, okay, we're, we know we need to do something. We need to be relevant. We have to be producing events. We're sprinting to the next one. And then we're sprinting to the next one. And when you can take that and say, we found a critical element and now we're making this a pillar, which means that we're going to focus on monetizing this and also continuing to redistribute in a way that lets us work off of what we know is working. So could be turning it into, you know, obviously white papers could be, wow, this, this keynote or the speaker really landed in such a resonant way that we can turn that into a thought leadership series. We can turn it into a new podcast series. Maybe there's upside for a user group for our prospects, for some of our key clients that might help move them through the pipeline in a bigger way. And that's also when you start to weave together this story of the events that we're doing are <laughs> a little moment in time, but also they're creating brand lift. And I think to one of the, the little zoom outs that we can do either as marketers, but certainly just as event professionals and planners too, is to get an understanding of overall, how did this impact our brand? Most likely you're gonna see a lift in your web traffic. You're gonna see a lift in social, in followership, in PR, in you know, how much content your speakers are sharing. Are your, are your sales reps booking more meetings? Are people a little bit more interested because of that? If you are looking at that data and saying, wow, we've, we've got prospects who are, are attending the events. That's great. Mm -hmm. There's probably a higher likelihood that they'll have a propensity to close depending on what our sales cycle is. So some of it is understanding what those reasonable data points are to look at, but mm -hmm. to not minimize how hard it can be. I mean, you might have data living in your CMS, in Right. Salesforce, in your virtual event platform, in a different web analytics platform. So being able to get your arms around that and tell a bigger story, I think is really important. 
For sure. It can be overwhelming. I mean, like you said, there's just so much more data now and trying to figure out how you analyze that, how you organize it um, into something mm -hmm. actionable can be a challenge. And you gave a lot of really good examples of how you could take that, those, you know, insights into what's working well and translate that into other content, into other strategies, um, like you said, like a podcast or a white paper. Um, so those are really great ideas. I want to dive a little deeper though into how you pinpoint what's working well and what's not. So uh, just to, to name one kind of area to tease out, what do you think is more important? The total number of views that a session gets or the length of time that people spend watching it? So if you get you know 10,000 people up watching one, which is a huge amount, but they you know 90% drop off after five minutes versus maybe one that gets 500 people, but they stay for the duration, which do you think is more important? Or do you think it's sort of not really an either or uh, formula? You have to kind of think of it contextually. It's a good question. I think, so I think it is contextual. I think both are incredibly important because they give you two different pieces of data. So if you look at volume and kind of to your point, if you say, interesting, here, here is the audience that we marketed this to. Our email list was X, our social channel reaches X, here's what we did on the, the influencer side. Here, here was our universe that we started with. And you know, maybe they had to go through a landing page, like, okay, you look at your, you know, kind of quintessential funnel, like, oh, we started here. And how many people, how many people did we get to this piece of content on this event, on this virtual event? That in and of itself is very interesting because one, you're seeing what messages are working probably what channels are landing and also the type of volume that you can drive. And then if you see that drop off, you go, huh, oh my gosh, we got 7,000 people, but we had 1,000 who, who stayed on, who didn't balance, who watched X amount of content, which of course is what we all want. I mean, that's, that's the North Star. We want everyone reading all 20 pages of our white paper watching our whole, you know, whether it's an hour, whether it's a half day, whether it's a day. So of course, engagement reigns supreme. So anyway, so I think both are important. We kind of talked through on the volume side. It's really interesting to see how much overall traffic you can drive because that is a part of the play. I mean, we want, we want to be reaching big audiences. We want to be growing our databases through virtual event or through content engagement. But if you're seeing a level of drop-off, and then you also have this subset of, hmm, this is who is the most engaged, depending on what demos you're capturing or what information you're able to track back, even if it's company, job function, job title, to see who is attending. You know, obviously if you've also got a little bit of, oh, we've been, you know, attending some of our events, then you back into, okay, we, these are either our super fans. This is content that's really landing we did a good job of teeing up the audience with the content. And then, and then you sort of turn it on yourself too and say, okay, we, we lean a lot into speakers and content and, and what makes the most sense because you do have to match, match those up. But also if we're seeing some of that drop off and it doesn't seem reasonable, let's look at how we orchestrated the event. Did it start off really strong? Was our MC engaging? Were we activating people in chat? What were there any tech issues? Was it hard to log in? Were we speaking the language of our attendees? Did we maybe upfront do too many housekeeping notes, too much sponsorship information? Everyone is just one click away from dropping off your event. Yeah, of course. From yeah. picking up their phone, from, you know, checking their work emails. And so I also think there is that very obvious, how did our marketing perform? Is this the right content for the right audience? And then being, you know, critical in a, in a healthy way in terms of, okay, if we look at that first 30 seconds, one minute, five minutes, did we deliver something that was so compelling that it was worth their time? Or did the people who remain on there was it just our loyal super fans? Every brand is going to have them. Um, and they, you know, they kind of hung on for the ride and they know us and they like us, but that's not a growth right. strategy. A growth strategy is making sure that you know, your marketing is delivering, you're getting that volume. And then what you're putting in front of them is so interesting, relevant, and compelling that they're willing to stay on. 
and continue giving their time. So, so both mm-hmm. tell a really interesting story. Right. I, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, um, so many good points there. One of the um, takeaways from a really high volume is that you've done a really good job of promoting it beforehand. You've come up yeah. with a topic that's interesting to people. And then in terms of drop-off rate, that can really give you insight into sort of more specifics of how you're approaching the topic. Was your speaker interesting? Did you spend too much time focusing on sponsors and all of those little granular things? And you can kind of dive down a little deeper to see what specific strategies might be working, but those overall volume levels can kind of give you an idea of what you did right before leading up to the event. Um, So that's, and you also those sort of um, figures afterwards can give you insights into your audience, which ones are are the most likely to convert afterwards, right? If they're staying for the full duration, that's a really good sign that those are qualified leads. Um, And I guess it also depends partly on your goals, right? Like you said, if you're trying to really build your brand reputation, those drop-off rates are pretty important. But if one of your goals is to just get leads by having people register for your event, you're going to get those, you know, even if they don't even show up to the event, right? You're going to get those emails. So um, it's all about these different strategies and kind of thinking uh, you know, very analytically about what each data point is going to mean for you and what you can get from that. Yep. And, and there is a lot to get from both. I mean, because two, if you've also hit a home run in terms of volume, because we do know that inevitably there's going to be some drop off, maybe there's just a level of, of curiosity, people put something on their calendar, and then their, you know, kid gets sick or what, you know, so there, there's some right. reasonableness right. To, that, to that. But if you have really hit a home run, you go, oh my gosh, we got thousands and thousands and thousands of people Mm -hmm. on this. Also know that, I mean, hopefully you were just pulling some really good marketing levers, but you really might have landed in your groove in terms of content or a topic or a speaker that that's resonating with the industry. So I think there is some look at the, look at the performance, dig deep, who stayed on. Okay. Did we do everything right? But also know that, that well, we might've stumbled into something here that we should continue to keep going because this is clearly landing and we can kind of run, keep running with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you hit that home run, you know, you've <laughs> got to get that first, right? If you do something really amazing and you get 100% people staying until the end, but you only get 50 people attending, then, you know, um, it's a lot of wasted effort, right? So you've got to get that yeah. initial marketing campaign, right? Um So we already uh, talked a little bit about this one, um, but I maybe want to expand a little bit on it. Um, Do you think there's value in tracking attendee behavior post-session? So I know you've already in some ways talked about that, but there are various ways you can do it. So, I mean, one would be um, tracking the number of participants who sign up for another event afterwards and sort of comparing that against which sessions they originally attended or the number who ended up converting, if you're promoting a particular product or service, or if your goals are educational, would you recommend maybe, you know, doing quizzes afterwards and then test checking the test scores to see how well um, the participants actually retain that information? Are those valuable ways to measure uh, the success of something? Or do you think it's more pertinent how uh, attendees rate the session? And would you recommend rating sessions? So these are sort of two different strategies for gauging success of a session ratings, which is really just sort of asking the attendees, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And then the other method, which is more like how effective were we in achieving the particular goal that we set out to to achieve? Yeah, I think, and my team loves when I say this, it's both. (laughs) We should do both. (laughs) Oh, great. Um, (laughs) But I think, (laughs) well, that's so good. So I do think rating sessions is helpful and interesting. I mean, we've always got even without audience feedback, there's, we can, we can measure how many people are viewing, you know, each session within agendas, we can see what they're bookmarking, we can, of course, see what they're attending. If you're using a a speaker graphic sharing tool, you can probably see who's sharing, how much engagement they're getting, if they have custom promo codes, if you're scanning it, you know, your in-person event, how many people are going into those sessions. So there's always been, you know, a bit that as event organizers, you go, okay, okay, we can kind of track who's, who's delivering and how audiences are are voting with their attention. But anytime you can get that layer deeper of, you know, what in terms of the content did, did they like, were they, you know, new or returning and and did that, did that land with them? I think it's, it's great. 
I would say the key there is make it super easy, make it timely, you know, quick, very limited number of questions. We are probably all, everyone wants survey data, everyone wants, you know, audience insights, but the heavier the lift and the more that we're asking of them, the, you know, so really curate that, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of the, the questions that you're asking. So I do that's think a good that's point. important. The survey itself could could undermine their satisfaction. <laughs> How satisfied are you? And then you ask 20 questions. I'm getting increasingly less satisfied, <laughs> decreasingly satisfied with each question. I know. Yeah. We've all seen the bar at the top where, you, you know, you're like, okay, I'll, I'll do the survey. Three questions in, you're like, oh my gosh, am I only like 1% of the way through this whole long, yeah. whole long survey? So, and I think that comes back to the, the why. And if the why is we as organizers, we can already track X, Y, Z, but we want to hear, because we know that understanding, you know, how speakers or sessions performed, take things a layer deeper, allow us to know if there is opportunity for these longer event strategies that we're doing, we're all producing more content than ever, that's very exhaustive. So, so why do we want to know? What do we need to know from them? And then keep it really short and sweet, because I think people will, they will give that feedback, but you just have to be reasonable about the ask. And in terms Mm -hmm. of tracking post-event engagement, sales, how things are moving through your pipeline, you know, what we've seen, the emergence of virtual, of course, became, oh, great. This is, there's a couple of different plays. This is either audience acquisition for lead gen. This is just a way for our brand to stay relevant and we can drive revenue because we can have a sponsor monetize it. But, you know, a lot of people are out in the market and going, oh, great, we're going to run these virtual events and we want them to be really interesting. But ultimately we want to get members to our association or we want to get people to, to pay and attend an in-person event, or mm-hmm. we want to, you know, help our sales teams either, you know, influence the revenue or certainly put people in the pipeline that, you know, aren't just taking calls from, from salespeople. So, which I think is, I think is great. Events are and virtual events and, and content production and webinar, whatever capacity you're producing within, they are great strategies because they're a micro commitment. They're a really reasonable way for people to engage with the brand. You can be really creative. So I think part of it is the mindset of going, okay, just because someone, and this is a little bit of the, put your consumer hat on. If I attend, if I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. I'm, you know, I want to kind of hear about this topic. This is the the world that I'm living in. So I'm going to join this session for 30 minutes. Might not mean someone's ready to buy, a, you know, your $100,000 SaaS tool or to become a member right then. So I think this is the, do measure it because everyone's wanting to get business outcomes and certainly the back half of 2021 and into 2022 is we're all in growth mode. Everyone needs revenue. We want to capture revenue. We want to be, you know, growing our businesses in smart and mindful ways. So do track that, but just also say, okay, let's, let's talk about the bigger picture. Let's talk about the customer journey here. We're producing this. These are our goals. We're hoping to get this type of audience. We'd love to see these prospects joining. We'd love to see these potential customers on there. Our hope is for it to turn into business, but if we really do something excellent, what are the follow-ups to that? Because we do want to kind of keep tracking. If they come back, is there another event that we produce for them? Do we serve up content? When do we do a handoff to sales? When is it right for someone to say, hey, have you heard about our member organization? Think you'd be a great fit. What is that? And so that's a little bit of a zoom out. Is it does not hurt to measure it? It's great to have those guardrails, but where you're going to be more successful is as a team when you're joined up on that strategy so that you know, we're going to keep moving them hopefully down this path, but in a way that's really customer centric. What kind of data or market segmentation should event organizers consider when they're planning their marketing strategies? You're gonna wanna look at what demos you have, who your ideal customer profile is, depending on what you're, if you're producing a hybrid event, if there is an in-person component, um, where you sit in terms of your your geo demos. So what would we realistically be driving considering events are much more regional at this point? Um, 
and then also past past buying behaviors. So what's our what's our churn? What's our average, you know, close rate depending on these personas? And I think to and and a lot of that, you know, as organizers or as anyone who's been been running events, we've we've got that people have to register for events, they have to fill out their their demographic information. And, you know, we can take that and we can, we can look at it. But I think what's also really interesting and a big opportunity in the event space for planning, for growing events is what are we doing on the audience research side? So we're, we're capturing that information based on those who have already liked, known, trusted, and opted in for an experience of ours, which is great because we want to retain them. And we want to align, we want to know who they are so that we can say we have the right message and the right product for you. So that's really critically important. But the other piece of it is that what that audience needs, whether they've attended or they are a potential net new attendee or client, is that their world is always changing. And you need to have a finger on the pulse of of what you're delivering in terms of a product, of what they mm-hmm. need. So if you're just relying on your first party data that you have, which we all have, you know, to some mm-hmm. degree, that's good. Be really mindful of it. But I would also encourage, and this is just something that's very much on my mind is, but how are we having, maybe it's one-on-one, maybe it's with customers, should also probably be through, through a level of customer research. How do we know what they need now, what our audiences need going into the future so that we're not just looking at static data right. and using that to plan our products or to go, oh, okay, great. They're still, this is their job function. So we're going to send emails that say this. Well, that their, their job function and their, their world and the problems that they're solving are probably changing so dramatically. I don't know yeah. anyone's world that hasn't been impacted by the changes within the last two years. So I think know your data sources, but also really challenge yourself to say, we probably need to go a couple layers deeper in terms of what our audiences need, what their pain points are. We probably think we know it. We're probably a little bit insular. And so let's find a mechanism, uh, Mm -hmm. a partner, a research agency, something we can do on our own, talk to customers, but we're having those really honest conversations. And we're not just looking at a spreadsheet of demos and thinking that we understand what everyone needs. That's such a good point. Things have changed so dramatically in the past (laughs) two years. (laughs) Incredible. And I mean, especially in people's professional lives, but really in in the entire sphere. Um, Speaking of which, I want to ask you about marketing for hybrid events. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's tricky for a number of reasons. Um, Hybrid events are, everybody says this is the way of the future. But when you're marketing it, one of the biggest issues is that they're really two separate events, right? I mean, we have the virtual component and we have the in-person component. And while, you know, in-person attendees may sometimes want to stream some of the virtual content, for the most part, um, their experiences are separate. So with that in mind, do you think that event organizers need to create separate marketing campaigns for each of these two formats? What's so interesting, I do think part of it is, I mean, a lot of it is going to roll up to what is the format of your hybrid event? To your point, if there's, because there are there are a lot where the ask is still to join live. So we're going to run everything concurrently. Of course, we've got, we've got an in-person event happening and we've got the virtual side where we're going to be streaming content, you know, audiences can be in chat together. And I think what's interesting about that is because we know for interesting hybrid events, the lift is really, incredible, you know, it does, we're like, oh my gosh, do we need new teams? Cause we can't really afford to have two teams doing this. And so, but for our, for audiences, especially if it is that format, they're not necessarily thinking of it as two different events. They're just thinking right. of it as their experience within that format of the event. They get the game. I didn't a budget. I couldn't travel. The dates didn't quite work. I'm, you know, not, not ready to go to in-person yet, but really excited to be a part of it. Oh my gosh, this keynote's gonna be amazing. So I think some of it is being very realistic and looking at your event format and and asking yourself, well, how are we wanting them to take part in this? If we want everyone 
to feel a part of this one experience, but we're just giving them options, then then that's a very specific way that you tee up your language. But right. the part specifically that you do have to create different marketing funnels for, because I would also argue people are, they're going to kind of get it, right? They, they want to see what's going on. They might even be curious about in-person. So you're, you're creating those different value props around each of the experience. In-person, virtual, because we finally got options, how great. And then once they've made their decision, then of course you put them on a very clear path around messaging, upsells, how to join, clarity around health and safety, confirmation. But I would say one of the one of the biggest things that we all also need to, to take a hard look at is are we very clear? Is language simple? Is it easy to understand? Can our audiences get the format of our event. And that might sound, you know, odd to say, but we, you know, we live in our world of sometimes acronyms or I think everyone hybrid is a bit right. ubiquitous at this point, but do they understand that, you know, don't use cutesy language. Can you join right. in person on these dates mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. virtual on these dates? Can you switch mm-hmm. your pass if you make that, make that decision? What do I get? Is, is past clarity very clear because that's that's the other side of this is when audiences have more choices I think they get that a lot of it is just being really clear about what they can choose and then once they do being really respectful of that choice and making sure that you're teeing up messaging that that makes them feel excited about that experience right right those are so many good points I think clarity is so important and even just clarity in terms of like you said if if you decide to switch from an in-person ticket to a virtual ticket, what are your options? What kind of, uh, you know, if you paid a certain set money for an in-person ticket, what kind of, uh, you know, money back will you get if you switch to virtual? But with that in mind, I I want to um, ask you a little bit about how you make it seem worthwhile to come in person while at the same time, not making it seem like remote participation is, you know, a step down or uh, making, remote participants and virtual participants feel like second-class citizens. How do you balance that kind of making the in-person experience seem like something really desirable, but at the same time, not making the remote experience seem undesirable, right? (laughs) Exactly. I think one, it starts internally with your team, truly believing and having the mindset that both are valuable and both can be exceptional. And that's because we're, we're all most likely coming from a world of in of, of in person events, and you right. know, oh my gosh, yeah. we can't wait to get back to face to face, and oh, aren't we so excited? And oh my gosh, I went to my first. We're having these conversations internally. We're leaning into that's that's so much more exciting. It's engaging all the sensory elements, and so I do think level setting internally and going, this is the event structure. We're thrilled about it we're giving our audiences options. We have ways to engage people that we couldn't before. That's the big opportunity. And we know that we are gonna build for both experiences. It's a lift, don't get me wrong. I know we're all (laughs) grown, it's busy, we're stressed. But, But really being honest about saying, we're honoring both, we're excited about both, we're planning for both in really mindful ways and keeping at it and not, and not internally kind of letting that that slip into, because also logistics are very different and the logistics of in-person, when you really get into that under the hood, day-to-day planning for an event can pull so much of your energy into that, into that direction. So I think making that decision, and then I think also, you know, doing almost an internal comms doc and saying, okay, here's our two experiences. What are the pain points of our audiences? How are we planning to solve them? What are the experiences that we're going to deliver to them? Do these feel needy enough? In person, Mm -hmm. we've got the city and the venue and the energy and the big screens and the AV sets doing some of our heavy lifting for us. In virtual, we don't. They're Mm -hmm. home, there's an Amazon delivery. We've got, you know, the smartphone is just sitting there. Is what we're delivering virtually compelling enough? Would it hold our attention? Is it exciting? Do we need to give them you know, a little behind the scenes scoop. Should we have our, our keynote do 
and an added round table. So I think really auditing each experience and making sure that you're looking at it and saying, okay, you know, we all do, you know, pre-cons before in-person event, okay, we we'll walk the space, we do this, do the same for virtual and make sure that you've got enough richness in there because you have to hold people's attention in such different ways. And with virtual, that that first 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute of, of everything feels like an hour. Both yeah. to both to viewers and certainly anyone who's running an event where there's a tiny delay. <laughs> oh! <laughs> no kidding. There's a tech and, difficulty that's pausing things. Yeah. I know. And in person, <laughs> they just, you know, chat with the person next to them. So I think yeah. having the right mindset, believing in it, staffing your teams accordingly, and then really building out those value prop flow charts. So you feel really confident that each experience is going to deliver something special to your audiences. Mm -hmm. So many good uh, pieces of advice there. Do you think there's any way that event organizers can use the online experience to help market the in-person experience or vice versa? Yeah. Do they somehow, can they work in a synchronistic way that, you know, yeah, they each see the other option as sort of a value add in some way? I guess there's, you address this somewhat with the, the element of choice, right? Just right off the bat, if you're saying you have the choice to do it this way or to do it this way, to participate in person or remotely, but, um, in the marketing phase, is there any way that you could, you know, maybe um, provide a little sneak preview of something that's going to happen online or um, show clips of some kind of in-person experience that you might somehow be able to kind of um, transmit some of that excitement to the online audience as well? Do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? I think that's kind of been one of the biggest exciting opportunities that came out of COVID perhaps for events, which is that right. we do now have more options for our storytelling than we did before. And I think that early, we thought early on that virtual certainly can be the right audience acquisition strategy and tee up for an in-person event, right? People are going to less in-person events. They're choosing how to spend their time. Budgets have changed. Our propensity to travel has changed. So you have mm -hmm. to, you know, you have to tell the story of why, why taking potentially four days of someone's time, depending on right. if you're running a large conference and trade show, what the size and scale of it is, um, why they should come, why they should give you right. that commitment. And so mm -hmm. with virtual, I mean, one, everything should always be value first, educational, helpful, but when you're able to give a preview of what an event might look like. You're able to sort of provide proof of concept, credibility for one of our events we ran, called it a pep rally for the industry, but we had a lot of the key, the key speakers on. And it wasn't just about, oh, come see us at the event, but it was providing true, here's, here's, my, top, here's my top tips for the month. This is what you need to know to succeed. Happy to provide it. We know this is always iterating. So this spring, when we know we're gonna be in X place, for our industry, we're going to be diving even deeper into it. So there's certainly a way it allows people to, again, make that little micro commitment. I'm not spending right. $1,500 or buying a plane ticket or, you know, going somewhere for three days. I'm, I'm hopping on and this, this could be a really good catalyst for me to be introduced to your brand. Then maybe I'm going to follow you on social and start asking people about it. If they've been to the event before, oh, then you've got another really topical virtual event. I'm going to check that out because that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of what I'm struggling with right now. And then, and then you start to feel connected to it. And it, it makes that, that fulcrum point of making a financial and a time commitment a lot easier. So I, mm -hmm. I definitely think virtual, especially with the lens of we're providing creative, pithy, timely opportunities to give people valuable content that they need. We're not going to over ask in terms of a time commitment, but we're going to make it really easy. It's a great way um, to create a buildup to your in-person event. And on the flip side with in-person, these are just always sort of exist in that we like have this huge crescendo. Oh my gosh, we did it. And now we can all fall down after and we're really tired and oh, we'll ramp up when we open registration again. And, and we know that that's changed. Everyone's living in their careers and their work and their their passions year round it's not just two days not every event 
have to have a community, but I think you have to have a relevant content strategy um, year round. And so that's also the opportunity is, is now that you are you know, hosting, if you're hosting an event in person and you have all this content, um, what are reasonable ways to capture it and not just recording sessions and making them available on demand, you know, what are interviews? Are you doing, you know, some really cool hype mm-hmm. videos? Are you making this like, you know, highlight reels that you can share? Are you thinking in terms of content capture around the personas that you have or the growth segments that you think you'll have for the year ahead? Um, how are you making, I think one of the biggest opportunities, we're seeing some of the shift, but it's always been about the keynote and get some really big speakers and then we've got our audiences and oh great, we've got sponsors and exhibitors here and underwriting the event, but it's a ton of thought leadership. You might have some of the biggest brands in the world with some of the smartest people. So talk to them, capture content from them and think about how they probably provide credibility to your event, but also how Mm -hmm. you can partner with them for the year ahead. So it, which can be tiring because there's we always go into an event, we're doing all these moving parts and it's, it's almost a little bit, again, of a mindset shift to think, how are we going to capture all of this? We're all really good about hiring photographers and videographers and recording stuff for on demand, but how do we, how do we iterate on that and still right. make it, make it relevant because no one just wants to watch replays four months from now of an event mm-hmm. that happened. But if you're having really interesting conversations that does allow you to keep that content going, even post event, which is ultimately what we all want. That makes so much sense. You're just sort of taking the most advantage you can of everybody who's yeah. actually there on site, you know, whether yep. it be your keynote speaker or some sponsors and some people within that sponsor organization who might be thought leaders in their own right, possibly, I guess, even uh, testimonials from attendees to see what mm-hmm. they're thinking. Yeah, yep. no, excellent points. Um, it's not just about recording your keynote mm-hmm. session. There's so many other opportunities there. Um, excellent, yeah, um, so many good insights. Um, I have one last question that I wanna ask you. You shared a lot of great insights on how to market hybrid events, but what about using them to market other products and services? So we've touched on this a little bit, but do you have any final thoughts to share in terms of not marketing hybrid events, but hybrid event marketing? And of course there's a lot of overlap and we've sort of, touched on both to some extent, Um, but yeah, I wanna hear your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, if you are, any event will work if it's authentic and valuable and helpful. And the goal is not just content distribution, audience acquisition, but you really ultimately want it to push your product or service or to launch a product or to, to make that case, you're a brand that's running an event to gain that, that market reach. Um, as long as it's relevant, authentic, and helpful, audiences will come along on the ride for you. I, I think, I actually have a good example of this. Early on in the year, there was a, a product that was, they were launching, uh, it was a SaaS tool, a CMS tool. And so, you know, clearly their strategy was probably, oh, okay, we've got this new, we've got this new product, we want to launch it, we'll do an event but who's just gonna to come to an event and go, we wanna tell you about ourselves. That's not, that's not the value exchange. So the product was for marketers and salespeople. So how they teed it up was they did a sales and marketing roast. So it was called like coffee is for closers and tea is for targeters. <laughs> they hired improvisers from Second City to come in and sort of roast the classic battle between nice. sales and marketing. <laughs> right? I'm getting you leads, you're not calling the leads. <laughs> They're not good leads. Um, and it was really funny. And the, the product was this backdrop to this event, which is, we know this is happening. We've solved it, but we're not gonna just talk about ourselves the whole time. We're gonna talk about you. We're gonna talk about how, you know, solving your problems, giving you a space to vent. Maybe it's a little bit of, a little bit of therapy. We're gonna show that we are credible, that we understand you. And the ask is also not to, buy it right now. We just want to, we want to have a conversation. It's a reasonable place to start a relationship as a brand around your product and service. So I would say just get the content right. Still think you can be very honest about those business goals. This is why we're doing it. This is the message we want to get across, but you just have to align instead of going, oh, okay, well, we want to do it. And then we're going to try to sell everyone. I'm going to do this. We'll do a pitch and our, our CEO will say why, and we'll, 
instead go, okay, this can still work even if we're letting our audience be the lead actor in the play. And even if we're letting content be front and center, because they're going to be curious. I'm sure you're going to get lift. We can follow up with them. We can put them in a, a nurture. We can deliver some really interesting stuff. We can do, we can do some smart, some smart follow-up. So I think it's a great strategy and a great way to get people's attention. Just challenge yourself to think really creatively about what would still be valuable as they're sitting on your event for 30 minutes, for an hour, for two hours, whatever it might be and honor their time. And then often you'll get that back in spades. Yeah, that's such a good point about honoring people's time. You know, especially in these days, everybody's wearing so many hats. Event planners, first and foremost, I think. But <laughs> certainly, you know, in, in general, so many people are, are pushed to the limits right now. Um, yeah. So, so many good insights there. Did you have any final thoughts you wanted to add? I'm just going to say, I think you make a really good point around, I know we've all started the, the mental health conversation we're wearing a lot of hats, but it is still a challenging time. Everyone is working incredibly hard. Keep talking about it. Keep leaning on one another. Resources like this, like LinkedIn, all the content that everyone is putting out is helpful. But you know, I think the more that we talk about it and the more that we're, we're honest and we all try to information share with one another, the better off we'll collectively be because it's been an exciting time in many ways it's been an exhausting time and everyone's doing yeah. a great job tech has kept us alive <laughs> like yeah. like a bmb have run events and you're just putting out resources left and right organizers are trying to serve audiences in new ways so i would just mm -hmm. say everyone be good to yourselves be gentle know that you're doing a great job and we'll all keep you know leaning on each other as we move forward into a new year thank you so much yeah those are such good points and yeah mental health is a major issue right now and we need to keep it we need to keep having conversations about it and yeah. um, be as supportive to one another as possible and be open about our own issues because yeah, yeah we all have our breaking point <laughs> oh, we do sure. we do and no one is ever alone we've got you know right. it's a great community got everyone's back so yeah mm -hmm. we'll get through it yeah yeah it's one of our strengths for sure the community <laughs> okay thank you so much for your time today Catherine. thank you this was great thank you it's fabulous yeah Thank you for listening to this edition of the Event Manager Podcast. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. For the latest news and the best articles on technology and innovation in the event industry, head over to eventmb.com.